I believe she is a no-nonsense person and probably someone to be reckoned with if challenged. She has fought against injustice all of her life. So welcome, Muriel. Thank you. Thank you. That was quite, quite an introduction. <laughs> well, you've had quite a life. How did you see yourself in the 1950s and 1960s in a segregated society? And what did you know about your ancestry? All right. Well, let's start with the 1950s. As you know, I was born in the um, pretty much in the early 40s, uh, 1940s. So I came through the end of the war period. Um, and I can remember some of the I guess you would call them privations that occurred in our community uh, with, with regard to the, the effects of the war. Because, you know, it's not just the people being fired at or the people doing the firing. Everybody who is in a war zone is a victim of war. And when the men, uh, at that point, they were pretty much men, came home, uh, or when they come home, actually, they are oftentimes bringing the war with them. It comes with them psychologically, it comes with them socially, and it certainly impacts them economically. And I saw that as a child, um, not understanding some things that I was looking at. So as we go through the 50s, I guess you could say I've, I've always been an observer. One thing I would like to say um, in my neighborhood, which was, we considered ourselves middle uh, class. Everybody that I knew had a job. Uh, and most people had um, two jobs, that is the mother and father both worked, um, and people were reliable. We didn't have too much of what I would call social fallout. But as you went down the street towards Sherman Avenue, there was a house which was inhabited in the basement by a group of men, and they were not so old, and they were alcoholics. And I used to see them, I mean, they weren't trouble for any of us kids. I learned over time that many of them were returning uh, veterans who were not really given any kind of assistance and they had all of the issues that veterans have. Many of them were basically shell shocked and some of them were quite sick um, in terms of disease, et cetera. One fellow that I can remember laughing at one day and his sister took me aside and she was an older woman and she said to me, my brother is fighting cancer. My brother has never been straight since he returned from the war. And I began to understand that there were levels and layers to what I was observing. And that, you know, I couldn't just go at first blush with what I thought I saw. So that began the process. Now, the second part of that is that I come from a family that was very organizational minded. My grandmother belonged to a lot of organizations, scores of them. And we went to a meeting every day. Sometimes we went two or three times a day. My mother couldn't find a job in Washington. She was off in some other part of the country uh, as a teacher. And that meant that I had to accompany my grandmother. And so there we were. I was with this old lady accompanying her to her various meetings. I resented it. And a lot of times I was angry, but I learned. I learned about organizations. I learned how to put a meeting together. I learned about how to ensure outcomes. You know, a lot of people think their meetings are the work, but no, the meetings are simply the glue that uh, occurs between the work that you're supposed to be doing before you get back to the next meeting. Um, I learned a lot of things. I learned um, the importance of civic responsibility. Early on, even before I got involved with civil rights organizations per se, I was in something, I was looking it up the other day, it was called the Biracial Committees. And a lot of people don't know about the Biracial Committees, um, but they existed. Some of them were offshoots, I guess, of progressive people. I'm not sure what their backgrounds were. But everybody that I knew, knew there was something very wrong with the way Black people were treated in the country. And so I joined them and I can remember at a young age being fairly disgusted with their slow pace. <laughs> and so I, I pretty much decided, well, that was that. I wasn't gonna go back to any of those meetings. Picking up behind all of that, I mean, I was in the brownies. I was in the brownies before I was officially able to wear a brownie uniform. 
I was going to the Brownie meetings with my girlfriends from the time I was about five years old until seven. Now at seven, I could get a uniform. I, that was a proud day. Um, and I stayed in the, in the uh, Girl Scouts until I got to be um, in the Senior Scouts. Um, and, I, and I loved the Girl Scouts. And uh, that, taught, that taught me camping. That taught me how to live rough and not feel like it was an uncomfortable uh, way of living because actually it's living the way um, people live with, who don't have conveniences. Um, so you learn how to wash in the river. You learn how to uh, be careful where you um, dig your latrine. Uh, you learn how to cook over fire. You know, you learn all those kinds of, of things and you learn to beat your mattress before you got in it so that if there was anything else in the mattress, it had an opportunity to escape. So these were things that as, as I went through life or have, as I have gone through life has, you know, these things have, have helped me, you know, maintain balance. In 1957, I was very active in the Luther League. I mean, I went everywhere in Maryland. Um, I went up to what they call the Hill Counties. I was, I was in places where, uh, in one case, uh, we were developing uh, Luther League chapters and this woman who was very well-to-do had me come and stay with her. I was separated from the other people. I might say that my little black church was the one black church in the entire Maryland Senate. So we were always like, you know, a drop of pepper in uh, a salt shaker. And so we were easily identified. The point that I'm making it with this story is she asked me to come and stay with her. And in the course of my staying with her, because I really didn't understand, well, why, why am I over here with you and they are over there? She said something to me that was not further explained. She said, they won't come for you here. And I began to understand that maybe there were some people who weren't pleased with my presence and that she was uh, giving me, she was extending her protection by name and reputation uh, for my safety, which I, I immediately appreciated, but I didn't have a context for it. That's one example of, you know, my understanding that everybody that didn't look like me was not an enemy and everybody who didn't look like me was a problem. Um, so as we proceed through the 50s, I had an opportunity to travel to um, Guyana, which at the time was British Guyana. And in 1957, that's what they call the changeover. That was moving from being a colony uh, to what I would say was a state of relative freedom. But as you probably know, all colonies sort of remain in a neo-colonial state, even at this day, um, because all of the institutional structures the institutional thinking is prevalent throughout the system. So there are lots of little pieces and lots of gaps in terms of how we look at things. But in any case, I was in Guyana and the newspapers which were in, uh, controlled by the colonial interests were just running amok with regard to the communist takeover of Guyana. Well, nothing could be further from the truth, but nonetheless, propaganda serves to galvanize people, to get them excited, usually about things that are only partially true or vaguely true, but not substantially so. But in Guyana, I got an opportunity to see a couple of things that began to uh, put me in a way of understanding myself, my people, uh, our conditions. I went up, I think, every river that Guyana has. In one of those river systems, I saw in the distance uh, some very, very tall palm trees, very tall. And they were taller than the palm trees in the generally lining the, the banks. And I asked, uh, what did that symbolize? What, who was over there, et cetera? And I was told those were Columbos. Well, the Columbos, as I found out later, are where the Maroons or people who ran away from slavery moved to, to stay out of the way of the enslavers. And they were usually in marsh um, territory, hostile territory. When I say that environmentally hostile, I mean, you had to go through the snakes and, you know, up there, the tarantulas. Uh, I'll tell you stories about the tarantulas um, and all kinds of creepy crawly things. But nonetheless, that's how determined this group of people or these groups of people were. And so I was looking at my first Colombo. And then, of course, when I got to graduate school, I had the opportunity of, of studying uh, of them, and some of them became very famous. Uh, some of them were able 
to maintain themselves for decades. And in some cases, uh, they were never reconquered. Those slaves were never recaptured. So when I came back from, uh, from Guyana in 57, I was pretty much um, fired up about wanting to know more. Um, I was always a reader. I was an avid reader. I had been reading since I was about four years old. Um, when I was 12, I had read every book in the children's section of the Petworth Library. And the uh, head librarian uh, took me upstairs and informed this very matronly white woman that I was due to have an adult card. And uh, aside from the fact that I was a black kid, uh, and this was the adult section, and I don't know if you remember those days, but we used to have very strong divisions between ages as well as racist. So here I was breaking all of that. But at my back was the librarian from downstairs who had accompanied me and informed her and she was waiting for the card. And so from that point on, I was now upstairs along with the grown people. Now, you know, and I used to read like four or five books a week. That was the, my sort of the rapidity of that. Now, bottom line is people didn't know what to do with all that information. But anyway, that's what kept me going. So then I go to high school. I'm part of the first class of uh, students going to Roosevelt Tenure High School in the uh, integration period. Mrs. Wells, who was our principal, actually hated us. And she was part of a, a congressional inquiry in terms of, well, what is this integration thing going to mean for your school? Now, Roosevelt High School was a, a very prestigious high school. Diplomats sent their children to this high school. Here we were. <laughs> no, that's the bottom line. Um, now, the people who came to this uh, school who were Black, well, I will say were the creme de la creme of the Black community. I mean, some of them I did not know. They were sons and daughters of doctors and people of, you know, professional standing. So they weren't dealing necessarily with people who were dealing with, you know, welfare concerns or that kind of thing. But of course, there's always a mix. But Ms. Wells let us know that she really uh, could hardly tolerate us. Um, and in fact, she only stayed for another year before she went off to Indonesia. Um, and I had the opportunity of laughing behind that because I said, well, if you think that we're black, wait till you see the color of the Indonesians, <laughs> you know, who are very black in that sun. Yes, moving past the senior high school period, which was not a great period for me, uh, you know, a lot of class divisions and color divisions, some of the things that divide things internally in the black community. Um, I went to Howard. I was expecting to go to Howard. I never thought I was going any place else but Howard University. And when I got there, I had in my second year, I believe, an opportunity to go to Southeast Asia. It was a six week uh, trip and uh, it was another eye opener, but it opened my eyes in many ways. We talked to student leaders, some of whom were in association with other people who had, put in jail, who had been put in jail for extensive periods of time, but just criticizing the government, you know, or demonstrating. And I began to understand that, well, all of these things are kind of relative. When people talk about freedom, it's not a broad-based thing. It is conditioned on your environment and the political apparatus that supports that environment. I got an opportunity to uh, hear and, and talk about a group of people that I had never heard of before called the Negritos, who were the original people in the Philippines. I never knew they even existed. They, all these are uh, building blocks for learning and storing information in the back of your head. And you begin to understand that as much as you think that you have been educated, you really have only been taught uh, only so much. And you've been taught enough for you to be functional but not enough for you to get the entire picture. Well, I had the desire to have the entire picture. I'm curious about what city you went to high school in. I was in Washington, D.C., the federal city. I lived in Washington, D.C. all of my life until I graduated in 1964. And when I graduated in 1964, I wished it a fond goodbye. Tell us about the closed society in Mississippi in the early 60s and what was your role? I'm, I'm curious because you're talking about Washington, D.C. You didn't grow up in Mississippi, 
but you definitely were involved. How did that all work? When I told you that I was going uh, to meetings with my grandmother, my mother was teaching in Mississippi. I did not know that. We did not share, um, you know, particular stories. But my grandmother would tell me, you know, snippets of information. My grandmother came from Texas. And my grandmother and her band of Black people had left Texas and had walked from Texas to Washington, D.C. It took them five years. Um, they were sought and hounded, but they somehow managed to get there. She had established herself as a, as a housewife and a married woman and raised her four children. And then one of her children, my mother, had me. Then my mother could not find a job in Washington because of the segregation issue. So she lived in Mississippi. So when I graduated from Howard, actually three days after I graduated from Howard, my mother discovered me uh, putting um, uh, books in a uh, suitcase in the hallway. And she asked me, well, where was I going? And I told her I was going to Mississippi. <laughs> Mind you, I had no clothes in there, I had nothing. I had no toothbrush, toothpaste, and just completely out to sea. I'm taking uh, books because I am going to teach in the freedom schools. So my mother decided that she needed to talk to me about Mississippi because Mississippi is not one of those places where you just jump up and decide you are going to go, you know. Um, but even after she told me about it, I decided I would continue on. What had happened in terms of a backstory is that since the early 60s, I had started working with the Nonviolent Action Group, which was a civil rights organization at Howard. I was deeply impressed with them. I was impressed with their intelligence, their integrity, their fortitude. I mean, they were just great. There was just nothing else I could say about it. The call uh, was made after SNCC uh, was formulated that there was going to be a summer project well, I knew I wasn't going to go on the Freedom Ride. My mother would have killed me, okay? But she was tolerant with my demonstrations. She was tolerant with my uh, willingness to go up Route 40, which was right outside of Washington, D.C., testing public accommodation. She was all right with that. She did not sit well with the Mississippi situation. Nonetheless, I was going to go. I had been indoctrinated. I was committed. But nobody can... Nobody can prepare you for Mississippi. I mean, it's, un it's like being prepared for war. They can only tell you the theory, okay? But you have to experience that. Um, I went to Oxford, Ohio, where we had a week of uh, orientation. And uh, this is the first time I met um, uh, Bob Moses. And I, it was, he was a man of few words. And one of the things he said is that, Mississippi needs no exaggeration. Well, that just stuck with me because as bad as the stories were that I heard, you're telling me that it can get worse? And the answer was yes. Uh, and, but we are going to do voter registration and anybody who wants to leave is free to go. Nobody thinks any the worse of you. Well, I wasn't leaving. And I got on the bus after a week and we were full of youthful enthusiasm on the bus. I've often wondered about these bus drivers. You know, I've never heard from them or knew them or, or saw them again. But these bus drivers who had one heck of a lot of bravery to take us. I mean, we were brave. They were brave, too. They weren't Black. And they weren't in the Civil Rights Movement. <laughs> they, they were earning a job. They, you know, they were, they were doing a job. But they were just as uh, vulnerable. Uh, as we were, okay. Um, nonetheless, as we drove from Ohio into Mississippi, we were singing songs and talking amongst ourselves. I will say that at the state line, it was just like magic. The bus just became silent. Just you heard, you couldn't hear a pin drop. It was like we were entering the chamber of death. And yeah, it was a horror. It was a horror. There was no question about it. But we, there was no turning back now. Well, whatever trepidations you had, now this is it. And so we proceeded into the state on this bus and people were dropped off in the darkness to other people who had been waiting for them. It goes to show you about SNCC organization, they're very good, um, who were receiving them and they would just fade into the darkness and they would just, they would just go. And I was dropped off in Greenville, um, Mississippi, which is, uh, 
a, a town in Washington County on the river. Uh, I could face the, the state of Arkansas. And actually, I will tell you, there's very little difference between the state of Arkansas and the state of Mississippi. Uh, maybe the spelling of the name, but that's just about it. My friend Charlie Cobb had been uh, the project director there, and I was glad to see him and other people continued on. About two weeks after I was there, Charlie Cobb looked at me and said, well, I guess you know as much as you're going to know, and I'm ready to move on, so I'm leaving you in charge. <laughs> That's how snake people would do things. I said, you're leaving me in charge? He said, yeah, you, you'll be all right. Well, I had Washington County. I had Issaquina, which was a black county that was founded after the Civil War by freed slaves. And then next to them was Sharkey County, which is a county that was supposed to be very active by Klan activity. And you will find that where there were freed slaves or freed ex-slaves nearby, you would find active Klansman activity. Uh, nonetheless, those were my three counties and I took my responsibilities very seriously. We had volunteers. I didn't really have a staff. SNCC didn't have very much money. When I finally got on the payroll, I got $10 a week and that was minus federal taxes. So it was 964. Never will forget that. That's like embellished in my mind. And then out of that, you had to pay rent and eat. So you can imagine that most of us were very thin and uh, functioning on what we used to call freedom high. You know, you just had this psychological push that you were going to do this. It didn't matter. Blah, 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 blah. That's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Our schedules ran from about 5 o'clock in the morning, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, to about midnight. So you can see we were always sleep deprived as well. So we were food deprived, sleep deprived, and most people did not want to house us because we were dangerous. We were dangerous because the local whites saw us as, um, what, interlopers. We were aliens. We were people who had come to disturb their tranquility. And obviously we were communists because only communists would do this. There we were. So I spent a lot of time on the floor. I learned to sleep on the floor. I learned you could put cardboard on the floor and it's not bad. <laughs> I have to tell you, it's better than sleeping directly on the floor. So I learned how to rough it. And uh, I also, uh, and we didn't have a car. Uh, we walked everywhere. And the black people gradually began to take, this is on a general basis, began to take heart from us because we were there, we were putting ourselves out there. Everybody knew who we were because we were not from there. Obviously we had to be part of this freedom group, whatever this freedom group was. Um, and so little by little, bit by bit, people uh, wanted to be knowledgeable about us. Washington County, I was able to get a, a young man to drive me around. In Issaquina, I had no car. I walked 50 miles. I walked 20, 30, 40, 50 miles in the course of a day. You know, you learn to pick up a pace and the sheriff would walk ride right next to me. Every time I turned around, the sheriff was informing me of the of prison that he had built for me um, that was sitting out in the middle of the sun. Now, he wasn't far off from his sense of colonization. I'll put it that way. Um, but I would speak to him, Chad, good morning, sheriff. And he said, how are you doing tomorrow? And we would go from there, and then he would go on about his business, and I would go on about mine. I had to be very careful. I did not want him to know where I was going. Sometimes I was deliberately quite slow. Sometimes I would just sit on the side of the road like I was a near-do-well, like I didn't have any idea what I was doing or why I was doing it. I waited until he had gone, and then sometimes I had to go a mile or two into the brush to meet some people who had houses deep into the, in the brush. All of this I learned, I learned to respect poor people. I learned to look at poor people in a different way than I had been probably trained as a young person because you know we were quote unquote middle class. We had cleaned this and cleaned that and poor people were dirty and had too many children and, and the whole nine yards. And I learned to look beyond that. I learned to look at them as people you know, and yes, everybody doesn't have the same capabilities, but that is not to say they don't have any. And that is not to say that they don't have bravery. And who were we going to talk to about registering to vote? The middle class in Mississippi was tiny. 
we were talking about talking to the broad group of people who will give us the volume. Um, now in Greenville, we had what they call um, a mock election. Uh, in those days, the UN was considered a very vital organization. And there were mock elections in various parts of the world to indicate to the United Nations that if these people could vote, they would vote. Okay, now in Mississippi, you know, going to vote might get you uh, a knock, a loss of a job, a loss of a house, or you could be killed. I mean, there was a, a, a sort of a spectrum, all of which were negative, about you deciding that you were going to do something, what they used to say, engaging in white folks' business, okay? Mississippi was very clear, you know, uh, you were black, get back, this is white folks' business, what are you doing in here? You have to live the Southern experience in order to understand it, because it does not translate easily. Um, and this is an inbred, exclusive club. It's more than white. But when I'm talking about Southern whites, this is an exclusive club. I don't care how poor you are. I don't care how much you don't have. If you're white, you're already 10 scales above the highest black person. Already. I've only seen this repeated in South Africa, which I studied when I was at Howard, when I was doing African studies. To make a long story short, I survived Mississippi. But Mississippi was um, very, very difficult, very hot. People were getting killed all the time. You really had to watch your step. And the people that they were killing were not necessarily civil rights workers. They killed them too. But they would kill black people with, with no hesitation. And in fact, they, I learned to understand in Mississippi, there were counties and towns, these counties that have all these glorious names. They're some of the roughest, toughest places you could ever want to go. The only thing I can liken it to, and I will just say this and, and, and let this ride for whatever it's worth, when the Jews were in trouble in Germany in the 30s um, and everybody turned against them. Now, I know people are going to say, oh, well, I didn't uh, know my family. Okay, let me put it this way. Most people, 98%, maybe 99% of Europe turned its back on the Jews. Okay. Now, and not only did they turn their backs on them, they were open, openly hostile. We look at the Germans being the perpetrators. Well, in some cases, when they went into what they call occupied countries, they were simply the facilitators because the local um, anti-Jewish activity was sometimes even worse than what the Nazis could have imported from Germany. I just finished reading a book about my favorite, one of my favorite heroes, uh, uh, Wallenberg, and I'm telling you, that book just bends your ears back with what was going on in Hungary. And so when people tell you they don't know, there are analogous or parallel situations that will bring this information forward. There is no excuse for people not knowing and pretending they do not know. Slavery was hell. World War II was hell. It was particular hell for the Jews because they were um, identified for extermination. We have people in this country now walking around talking about, you will not replace us, and walking around with their torches, and they're talking the same stuff. They're talking the same stuff. And I'm thinking, well, is there no standard that we are going to have in this country? I may not like you, but it's not my prerogative to decide that I should be able to kill you. I should be able to kill you because I don't like either how you look or what church you go to or what synagogue you go to. What kind of foolishness is that? Um, this country is an immature country. We have to grow up. You know, there's freedom, but there is also um, a level of morality that you're going to have to, and I say you, I'm talking about universally you, you're going to have to espouse if we are to go forward, if we are to survive, do we have to spend all of our work, waking days fighting each other and killing each other? That's absolute stupidity. And that's not very far from the cave days. Okay, so I've finished preaching. Okay, I'm done for right now.
The Council of Federated Organizations, let's talk about that a little bit. It was first formed in 1961 to support jail freedom writers. I knew about the Council of Federated Organizations when I came to Mississippi because we were oriented to know that uh, several organizations have come, had come together to create an umbrella for functioning in the South. Why was this umbrella necessary? It was strategic, actually. It looked better. Certain places like the NAACP had a very um, fine apparatus for getting out information. And I think at that point, the NAACP and the Legal Defense Fund were all together. They had not separated at that point. We had uh, the Congress of Racial Equality. This is before Roy Ennis. This is when we had um, the notable Mr. Uh, Farmer, who was quite uh, a fine person. And then, of course, we had the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Now, I will say that most of the sense of COFO, that's, that was the acronym, was SNCC oriented. They were young people. Many of them were local young people. Young people are very interesting because, first of all, young people are very hard-headed. You know, they're very self-directed. They have a very keen sense of knowing what they think needs to be done. But in SNCC, interestingly enough, we had some oldsters around. We had uh, some older women who came out of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. These were women who were clearly 20 years or more older than we. And uh, we learned to listen to them. That's one of the things I learned in SNCC. When we had meetings, and you could have, our meetings were interminable. They would go forever. But the point that I want to make is that you were told early, listen to what is being said. Do not disregard it. Do not disregard their, their grammar, because they may not have any. Okay, D don't disregard this, the simplicity of their sentences. These are people who have survived in Mississippi. They're older than you. They know more than you. You need to listen. And I learned to listen. And I listened to everybody about everything, including some things that maybe I discount. Just because you're listening about them doesn't mean you're taking it in uh, as a part of you, but that you are weighing the material. Some things you will take in. Some things you will say, well, I don't really know about this. But some things you'll say, well, I'm going to look further at this. When you were in a battlefront, you have to have faith in the people that are to the left of you and to the right of you. If you don't, you're in the wrong place with the wrong people. Okay. We were in a battlefront. It is a domestic battlefront. But when we looked at those hostile white folks in Mississippi, uh, it would, could have been anywhere. We could have been in Flanders. We could have been in West Berlin. We could have been anywhere. Okay. We were a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And those connections continue and endure to this day. Even though there were people and sometimes um, things came ab uh, about that suggested there needed to be a fracturing of that relationship. I respected everyone who worked in SNCC, even folks that I got angry with and screamed at and cursed out and, you know, just said, I, you know, I just couldn't go for that. Then you have to come back to the meeting and you have to sit down and you have to listen to it again anyway. So you might as well listen the first time <laughs> uh, and learn to be respectful. That's another thing that I had to learn because I was used to basically being able to just sort of flaunt my opinion. No, your opinion is one of many opinions. And I loved the way SNCC people weighed in because they'll take some of what you have to say and some of what you have to say and some of what somebody else has to say. Let's see if we can work on a common thread. And that takes skill because that takes away the ego and that puts out the work. And SNCC was very work oriented. So getting back to COFO, let me explain. CORE was basically a Northern organization. As you indicated, they had been very active with regard to the um, Freedom Rides. And the Freedom Rides did bring people all the way into the South. But let's put it this way, the staying power in the South takes a, a, another kind of 
level of ingredient that a lot of Northerners just don't have. Um, and so SNCC, uh, the core actually became Southern core, the ones that we worked with. And they came out of New Orleans. And uh, in fact, it was Southern core that ran the Philadelphia, Mississippi project out of which those people were killed uh, early on. Um, and um, the Roy Wilkins uh, NAACP, they had problems with young people. They had problems with young people being self-directed. Um, we had brilliant young people. I mean, for whether you like him or not, Stokely Carmichael, who's changed his name, Toure, Kwame Toure. We had Cortland Cox. We had um, Ivanhoe Donaldson. We had James Farmer. We had people who were what I call heavyweights. They could hold their own regardless of who they were speaking to. These people were not going to bow to Roy Wilkins, who had a terrific organization and a not too small ego. Is that an easy way to say that? We had issues. We just had issues. And as the Mississippi heated up, because as I told you, people were getting killed all the time in Mississippi. The Northern aspect of the NAACP pulled away and the Southern aspect of the NAACP stayed with us because we were the only people who had the staying power. What was our staying power? We were just tenacious. It was just as simple as that. We weren't going anywhere. I mean, you will have to kill us to get us out, but we were going to be there and I'll see you in the morning. There were people who took us in, who protected us, you know, who fed us. And that is how the, the COFO operation went. Now, I was not elected to be the COFO person. Uh, Jesse Harris, who had run the COFO office all summer, had had it. And he put up a public notice that said, anybody who wants to run this office, feel free to come because I'm leaving here. And he gave a date and a time. And he said, and the keys will be on the door. I have had it. And I was the only one who showed up. <laughs> I said, well, where's everybody? Said, everybody else had sense enough to stay away, Muriel. Here you are. I inherited the state operation. Now, what was this? People had just gotten beaten down. They were exhausted. They were tired. They were hungry. And I guess they were tired of sleeping on floors. I mean, it's as simple as that. I mean, I used to sleep, I, our office, at a certain time, I had to put my feet up because the, the mice would be running back and forth on the floor. I used to say, well, here's the mice baseball game starting up. I mean, you have to laugh at some of this stuff because it was really weird. My mother would, I never told my mother some of this stuff because she would have said, well, what is wrong with you and why are you still there? But the point of the matter is that you have to live with the people that you want to change and shape. If you're living in the Hilton and you're going to their house, which is a lean-to, they're already class divisions. You don't have to say a word. If you listen and control all of the conversation and they are not saying anything, you are already divisions. You're trying to make a, a fellowship. You're trying to say, you and I are one. On this issue, we don't have any disagreement. And our issue was the vote. It was as simple as that. It was one man, one vote. Now, there are some places in Mississippi, like Issaquita County, which is a black county. The officials from Mississippi all came from Arkansas and they were all white. When I looked at the voter rolls, most of the names of the voter rolls were people whose names were on grave markers in the cemetery. They had been dead. They didn't exist, okay? But they were filling the roles. Now, you want to talk about voter fraud. I can tell you voter fraud, okay? Um, and so when we started uh, challenging that and say that these people did not exist and you are filling the roles with fictitious names, et cetera, this was a wide practice. This was, not, this was not a new practice. This had been going on for years. This is how, you know, in certain places, when you talk about the census and stuff like that, who's filling out the forms? Where do the forms go? Who, who's verifying that these people exist? Oh, there's a whole thing of fraud that just goes back years and years and years, but it's not, it's not fraud on the part of people who try to get the vote. 
it's fraud on the part of people who are holding the levers of power. That's where the fraud is. So I'm trying to give you some understanding that actually SNCC kind of took over the Mississippi Summer Project. Tell our listeners again what SNCC stands for. What are the letters and what is this? what's the full name? It's a Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Student directed. It was uh, called for by Mrs. Baker, uh, who thought that after the uh, Freedom Rides, students had shown enough fortitude and enough determination to have their own organization. And they just needed somebody to let them know that. And so she called uh, them. I couldn't go down to that either because uh, that was um, spring exams and my mother was going to kill me again, okay, if I missed the spring exams. You know, like she was putting up with a whole lot from me. They went down Shaw University. And when they came back, they had a new organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating, Coordinating Committee. Now, uh, as young people will do, they will give you an acronym quick like a bunny. So it became SNCC. There's no way you can get SNCC out of SNCC. But they'll say SNCC called SNCC. And so there we were. And people who ran the organization were quite smart and quite um, experienced. And I, when I joined, um, I was, I think I was respected. I, I think that's how people took me because I was an organizer. You know, I wasn't f fresh out. I wasn't an office worker. I was a field worker. I would work in the office. I was good in the office, but I like talking to people. I like inspiring them. I, I didn't love getting up at 4.30 in the morning, but we had to get up early to get to people before they got on private land because Mississippi is one of these places where you will get shot on private land. Um, and they have these great big trespassing signs on the, on the trees letting you know that you will be shot if you are trespassing on this property. So you have to talk to people on their way to the cotton fields. At, at that point, um, the cotton fields had not become completely mechanized, so there was a lot of hand labor. Uh, and we would meet people on the roads coming in. Um, they didn't have cars either. They were walking and we were walking too. And I guess they figured, well, if you're up at 4.30 in the morning talking about voting, I guess I need to listen to you, but I can't slow down because I have to be at the place at a certain time. So you just walk along with them. And every morning, I'm going to be out here, you know, and I'm going to try to get you to come up to the courthouse and put your name down there. Now, when I was in Issaquita County uh, I was, uh, on this particular uh, occasion, the sheriff was sitting there next to the man with the, with the very famous jelly bean jar. You know, that was one of the big tests to, to guess uh, how many jelly beans were in the jelly bean jar or how many beans were the jelly bean. I mean, they had incredible, I mean, just incredible tests to see whether or not you could legitimately uh, put your name down as a citizen, okay, to vote. You had beans to count, you had jar, uh, jelly beans to count, and then sometimes they had the audacity to give you a section of the Constitution for your uh, written interpretation of what it said and for which they were going to make a judgment before they decided that you can vote. Oh, they have done all kinds of stuff. You know, now this was after, of course, the, um, the payment system that used to exist um, in the past had been outlawed, but they would come up with all, these are just obstacles. And they, you know, you're talking to people, many people in Mississippi hadn't had education beyond the third grade. Why? Because in Mississippi, they didn't intend to ed educate the black people beyond the third grade. It's as simple as that. I learned that, you know, uh, you could come to school, but when the cotton had to be planted, school was closed. When cotton had to be weeded, you know, we had to pull the weeds away from the plant so that the, the cotton will grow unhampered, the school was closed. When cotton had to be harvested, school was closed. Their school was on, a, uh, on an agricultural cycle that was all year long. And so you were lucky to get in three months of real education, given all of this interruption. Not to mention the machinery and all. I saw horrible accidents on the part, you know, the gin um, machines, et cetera. Those were raw machines. You had to be very, very careful. You know, cotton is bundled in these huge bundles. You have to take that into the gin machine. And people, you know, miss arms and, all kinds of, uh, and you know there's no insurance, and you know nobody is going to take care of you. And so, of course, one of the real desires on the part of Mississippi Blacks was to get educated, because who wants to continue this generation after generation? This is ridiculous. 
you know. Okay, I don't want to go on. Were you actually involved in any marches? Oh, my goodness. I marched so much. I, <laughs> I told my mother, I'm not going to have any shoes <laughs> because I'm, 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 you know, wearing the soles and the, and the heels down. Yeah, always on many a march, many a march. Uh, I don't know whether the march has changed my life, but let me just tell you this. When I joined the Nonviolent Action Group, I actually was f going to a meeting with a friend of mine who is now deceased. She said to me, I'm going to a meeting. I said, well, good for you. And she said, no, I want you to go to this meeting with me. With me. Now, I had known Janet since we were in elementary school, my good friend. And so I followed her. And I went to Emea's house. And I went into a room that was wall-to-wall -wall students. I had never been there before. And I had never seen so many students in my life gathered to talk about anything. They had gathered to talk about a demonstration that was going to occur the next day at the Justice Department. Well, this was all news to me. The person who was doing the talking when I got in there, I finally learned, was Stokely Carmichael, who was quite elo eloquent in his orations. His eyes locked on me. I don't ask me why. And he said, and you are going to be in charge of communications. And I said, I don't know anything about it. He said, don't worry about it. You will. By tomorrow morning at five o'clock, you'll know everything you need to know. You're going with me when we leave here. And I did. I went with him. His, he and three other guys had an apartment, uh, which became our hub. And that is where, you know, they put me through the paces in terms of learning what we're doing, how you approach people on the phone. Uh, John Doerr was the head of the Civil Rights Division at the Justice Department at that time. I worked with a script that uh, they wrote. And at five o'clock in the morning, I had been up all night. I had, that's when I learned you could actually be up three, three days and nights without losing your sanity. That is what I learned <laughs> nag. And I called John Doerr to inform him that outside of his door was a demonstration about something. And I don't even remember what that first demonstration was, but that was the first time I had seen and I understood how you put together a picket line. Our picket lines were very organized. We were told to dress up when you came to um, a picket line. Don't come with t-shirts and, and uh, jeans and stuff like that. You put on your, your suit. Uh, you want to look your best, you know, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to impress these people. The idea is that you are ready to be included in the society. You're no longer on the outskirts of it. Our signs were not pasteboard signs. They were really hand lettered and very well presented, I must say. <laughs> you know? um, and that was the beginning. And I, I guess I was in a, a demonstration at least once a week, every week for the next three years. Demonstrations. We were our own grouping. Very rarely did people come from the sidelines to join us. They mostly looked at us as if we were strange. And this was black and white people. Okay but they did read. We were uh, organizing a, a NAG for uh, municipal employment of blacks. There were no black bus drivers, no black um, streetcar drivers at that time. I think we still had streetcars. There were very few firemen. In fact, my aunt was good friends with the first black uh, fire chief in the city. Um, so jobs were very restricted. So we were demonstrating against that and then Howard University was dealing with a con huge construction uh, project. I mean, it was huge. And there were no black people on that construction project. Well, Carmichael said, well, we're going to have a picket line around this one. And certainly we did. And of course, <laughs> President James Nabert was about to have a fit because every time he looked up, we were just, we were like mosquitoes. You understand what I'm saying? And he was tired of scratching and we were giving him plenty of itch. That's how it, it, it grew. You see it, you saw an issue. You brought it to the group. The group made a decision. Is this something we're going to take on? Uh, there was Glen Echo Amusement Park. Black people couldn't go to the park. And then at some point they said you could come on Wednesdays. Well, you know, come on people. So we were demonstrating at Glen Echo. And we had a very interesting mixture. You know, a lot of our students came from American University, George Washington University, Howard. I'm trying to think of what other schools were there. But these were... Um, well, basically well-heeled white kids. 
uh, who were running with us. I mean, these kids, you know, they lived up and down Connecticut Avenue. I mean, they, they had money. And they came from very liberal families. And families were very supportive of, of their work. And this was, you know, what, 1961, 62. So by the time I got to Mississippi, you see, I was an old hand, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, you were on the front lines, really, during the 1960s. All of you were really risking your lives in many ways. That's true. Well, do you have any other stories or recollections that you could share with us? Oh, I have many. I mean, I've had the shotgun in the face. I mean, I've had all, you know, all, all kinds of things. I mean, I've investigated murders. I've done all kinds of things. But you just keep on going. Um, and yes, some of them are hair raising. You know, everybody who was in the movement did not come out the movement whole. We had people who had nervous breakdowns. We had people who became alcoholics. You know, not a whole lot, but you know, it was significant and they were our friends. You know, there were people who just got shattered. Um, my friend Cynthia got somehow or another hooked up with uh, an organization that Pinochet, yeah, Pinochet had a bomb planted in a car that she was almost getting into and those people were killed. My own idea is that, you know, Cynthia suffered from PTSD as a result of, of that experience. But we were young, we did not know. Like we didn't know about the alcoholic ex-soldiers. Almost every man that I knew, my uncle was in the war. My, both of my uncles were in World War II. Actually, that is the war. And my uncle told me one time, he actually sat down and talked to me about his being in the war. And his commanding officer was an alcoholic, became an alcoholic. He was a graduate of West Point. They never, when he went to West Point, they did not speak to him for four years. No one spoke to him, okay? They did not want him there. So when you look at these people now and you, you have to look at them through a long lens, what would it cost you to say, good morning? What would it cost you to say, sit over here? That takes bravery too. That takes another kind of bravery. You know, all bravery is not facing a gun. Some bravery is speaking out and saying, you're not going to tolerate this kind of behavior. This is psychological warfare. In any case, my uncle told me about coming in through the boot of Italy. My uncle, first of all, my uncle Solon had passed all of the exams that they had given him with flying colors, but they wouldn't give him commission because they said no black man could ever have tested that high. <laughs> His battalion was an all black battalion. I cannot find any evidence of this information except from what my uncle told me. He said they were the bullet stoppers. He said they were sent into war and some of them had no bullets in their gun and they had to face the Germans, that's right. And this is what broke these men. He said that that's why when you look at these alcoholics, Muriel, they broke because they did not expect to be sent to be exterminated. And this is exactly that kind of policy. So the United States has got a lot of blood on their hands. I say all this to say that when the guys were in the military and they did learn to shoot and they did learn to, to function under disciplined situation, they also developed a sense of what did they want when they returned. You know, what, what did they want? I mean, here you are fighting these people over here, but when you come back over there, you're going to have to still deal with some of these knuckleheads. And the point of the matter is, yes, you are. And for everything that Black people have managed to get in this country, it has been begrudgingly given. And the point that I think a lot of white people miss is that if it's for the benefit of, of Black people, don't you think that white people benefit from it too? I have not seen any law that ever says that this is only for Black people. I have never seen a law that said that. People live in all kinds of circumstances in this country, Black and white. And there are many poor white people in this country. And we have got to get, stop. I don't know what we are doing, but we're not helping ourselves and we're not helping them. It's no benefit to them to quote unquote, be white and wretched, just like it is no point for us to be black and wretched. That's just ridiculous. And so we, that's what I mean when I say the country has to grow up. 
you know, you've got these young men walking around with torches talking about we will not replace you or you will not replace us or something of equal foolishness. Nobody's trying to replace anybody. What we're trying to do is all live here together. There's only one country. And no, you're not going to eradicate people. People are not going to lay down and let you eradicate them. What is wrong with you? You know, the fact that you don't have a job, the fact that your, your education is fractured, the fact that you come from a family that really needs to be reviewed because obviously somebody who raises a child who thinks that you can go out and just kill somebody with impunity is coming from a very dysfunctional family base, you know, and there's no excuse for this. You know, this is supposed to be advanced civilization. Well, let's get advanced. Tell me the story of the shotgun in the face first and then we'll go on. In Mississippi, there was something called the Sovereignty Commission. Now, the Sovereignty Commission was basically the state's apparatus to infiltrate the civil rights movement and to find out what we were doing. Now, the civil rights movement was not doing anything that was a secret. They could have walked through the door and basically said, can I see the minutes of your meeting? Because they were breaking in my office all the time and taking the papers. So they just, they just could have asked. Okay. Um, but they hired particularly Black people. Uh-huh to uh, quote unquote, find out what those communists were doing. Cause they were convinced that they, like I said, they had to be communists. And I said, you know, nobody has to travel 8,000, 10,000 miles away to tell me that I've been mistreated in this country. Well, come on people. Anyway, the point of the matter is there was a man who I ran into in Jackson. I don't remember his name, but he was identified to me as a member of the Sovereignty Commission and that I needed to be careful. I was in a restaurant, actually in Mississippi, you could eat and dance. I was in a restaurant and I was dancing with a young man. We were laughing and we were having a good time and I turned around and this man had pulled a gun in my face. Okay. I hadn't paid much attention to him, but he was in the same restaurant. And I think that he thought we were laughing at him, which we were not. The point of the matter, that was the issue of the shotgun. And of course, everybody in the restaurant was like, woo, and all of that. You know, look, if you're going to kill me, kill me. Okay. In the meanwhile, take the damn gun out my face. Okay. It's as simple as that. And he just sort of backed up and, and moved on. I mean, listen, I have all these witnesses. Do you really want to kill me with all these witnesses here? Because all your white friends are not going to save you. You are going to parchment. You do understand that, right? Okay, fine. Thank you very much. That was one instance, you know, I've had other instances where I've had to face lethal uh, weapons. Um, it, it's not a good feeling by any stretch of the imag imagination, but you know, you can't wither because the, 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 the ball is in their court. So the question is, what are you going to do? Okay, I'm not going to insult you. I'm not going to infuriate you, but I'm going to let you know that I'm not going to wither because you pulled out a lethal weapon. You understand that, okay? So that's that was the that's the example that comes to mind. Now I will tell you another example that was more withering to me than the shotgun in my face. I called a meeting. I don't remember what town Mississippi got lots of towns, lots of settlements. They're so small that they aren't even on the map. And I called it uh, at this little church way over into something or another. Well, I get there with my white cohort <laughs> from the office and there's a bunch of white men sitting there waiting for me. And this is night and they're not happy and I'm not either. And I asked them, what are you doing here? And they wanted to know, you know, we had this back and forth. What are you doing here? I'm having a meeting, but I don't believe I invited you. I did not um, provoke them because it was too, it was simmering right at the top. But I said to them, you're not invited to the meeting that I'm having. He said, well, you call for a meeting of mechanized, mechanized cotton pickers, I think it was, because these people handled that part of the machinery. I said, I may have, but I was not expecting you. And as far as I'm concerned, you are free to go. And at some point they turned around and, and left. I, but I will tell you, I was very, very nervous about that because there was like 12 to 15 of them and it was me and Russ. <laughs> and Russ 
was a little old skinny white boy. He was he was no backup whatsoever. <laughs> no. And I weighed 105 pounds. So, you know, between the two of us, that was going to be something. I ran into a police car once in a, in a town. I've had this experience before. I can be very dramatic. And I ran into the police car, and it was accidental, of course. And by the time I finished my drama episode, <laughs> the policeman said, just get back in the car and go, and go about your business. <laughs> For which, for which I was glad that happened. I handled the bodies that uh, that came out of uh, uh, Philadelphia. I did not physically handle them, but I was in the SNCC uh, COFA office when uh, Rita called and said that she had a special coroner standing by to receive these bodies because the state of Mississippi had indicated some foolishness in terms of these uh, three fellas basically either killing themselves or accidentally these deaths occur. It was ridiculous. And, and one of the things I have to say about this, they don't mind looking stupid. That's not a problem. You know, they just want you to just, to just accept it. That's, that's what they want you to do. And so uh, my, my job in that regard was to facilitate the transfer of the bodies into Memphis. That's where the, the coroner was standing by. Uh, to review. I had the, the, the occasion to speak to the coroner, and I will tell you, I don't remember all that he said, but I do remember he said he has never seen anything like this. He's never seen this, this kind of bestiality, brutality. Uh, James said there wasn't a bone in his body that wasn't broken. What, what kind of beasts are these? Even wolves don't do this. And this is a system that has been functioning in this country for over 400 years that has seen some kind of justification. I was telling my good friends at the Brooklyn Society, I said, people come out of church and would go to a lynching. I mean, it was like there was no second thought that maybe um, this is not something we should be doing. There's a lot of, I'm going to put it with ignorance, I'm not going to give it fear because fear, you have to know what you are fearing. I'm going to say it's ignorance because there's a void of information and they don't want to fill that void because they'd rather not know than know. And so we have a lot to do with our education system because it has failed unbelievably. Not everybody, you have to educate yourself as well as go to school. You know, the teachers can't do everything, you know. And some of us come from families that are ignorant. That's what teachers are supposed to do. They're supposed to help students take these steps. Not what you are to believe, but you are to search for the truth. That is your job, you know. And students are very special people because they've already said, I want to know. It is the teacher's job to provide the, the, the impetus for that, the support for that. And I tell them, you can read anything you want to. Only when you know what they're saying can you refute what they're saying. You can't have one conversation and he's having another conversation and other people are in the middle and they don't know what the devil to make out of either one of you. Why aren't you proud of something that makes some kind of sense as opposed to walking around with people who are threatening other people? What is wrong with you? What is there about your sense of who you are that would give you the prerogative of thinking that you can intimidate, intimidate people um, into silence, into submission? Who are you? And the other thing I wanted to say before all of this closes out, you know, the Germans who went behind Hitler, you know, there was a point at which Hitler said, they don't deserve him, they deserve to be bombed. Okay, there was a point at which when the, uh, the, when the Americans and the Allies were bombing, they had bombed Berlin, they had bombed a number of places, and, and our, our boy Goring would say, oh, those aren't bombs. Yes, they were bombs, too. Uh-huh, people were dying. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm talking about German people. And he swore that the, the Allies would never bomb German territory. Well, here come the bombs, okay? The bottom line on that, Hitler went off and left them. He went off and left them. 
He killed himself. He said goodbye. He didn't want to be bothered with them. They don't deserve him. People who think that you can get on top of somebody else also think that they're going to be part of the exceptional group. Let me tell you something. All you have to do is read history. You will know. There is no exceptional group. Once they have finished eating, beating, and killing one group, they turn on each other. That is how the story goes. And it has been going that way for eons, okay? You, whoever you are from whatever foolishness it is, put your head in a book, stop stomping around and looking foolish, stop going over to the Ukraine and trying to learn how to shoot so you can come back here and start a class war. We all have enough problems. We got COVID, we've got problems with our educational system, we've got our own problems, and we need all of the intelligence together, not separate, okay? All right, I'm finished. What would you advise for the next steps for the Black Lives Movement? I think the Black Lives Movement people need to be organized better and differently. SNCC needs to come about again. It needs, you know, you need to have a headquarters and yes, they are going to come in it. They're going to blow it up. They're going to firebomb it. They're going to do all of that. But you need to have an address. You need to have a place where people can come and gather. People need a catharsis. They need to be able to come and think together about what they are going to do. And by all means, everybody needs to have their head in a book. That's one of the things I loved about SNCC. Everybody had their face in a book. Television's off. Okay, they did not have that stuff. You know, everybody that I knew, including the ones who were struggling with their third grade education, were trying to understand what people of renown, people of experience were saying about the subjects that they were trying to get through. None of this stuff is new. Human beings have been struggling against oppression the entire time. It's either been a king it's all, or it's been a gang leader, or it's been a this, or it's been a that. Why do people want to continue that? I do not know. Some of us do not want to continue that. And I think that people who think need to think about what they're doing and not just react. I'm looking at these fires in California and Oregon. When you have to move 500,000 people out of the way of a fire, don't you think you have something significant to deal with? When you are moving between either fires or land or landslides, don't you think you have something that you need to pay some attention to? And the people that you keep sending to Congress who are telling you, oh, don't worry about it, it's okay, oh, they're just making that up, oh, that's propaganda, don't you think you need to change uh, the people who represent you? Don't you think you need to make some visitations to them and let them know? If you say one more stupid thing, you will not represent us not another day, okay? I mean, I just think that in the short term, Americans are going to have to grow up quickly. You know, it's like the pregnant girl. She didn't know how she got pregnant, but she's pregnant. Now she's gonna be a mother. There's not a lot of time, you got nine months to cover what, years your life is gonna change forever. Are you going to make this a good change or are you going to go down the tubes? Everybody who gets pregnant doesn't have to go down the tubes, okay? All right, you can find strength in yourself and you can find strength among people that you know. This country has nurtured, I'm trying to think of the worst animal reptile kind of things that I can think of, but definitely poison definitely poison. It hasn't made me change my mind. I, I got sense enough to know that they, they're white people who are not crazy. Just like I know that they're white people who are crazy. And I know that they're black people who are crazy. And I know that the black people are not crazy. I'm trying to get the non-crazy people together. Okay. Because there's not too much you can do with the others. All right. They're going to have to come out of that themselves. In the long term, this country is moving from its height into a new level of settlement. I don't know what that means. England did that. You know, at one point, England was everybody's mother, but then it had to settle because that situation was untenable. You can't run a hundred and some odd countries 
by yourself, you little island. At some point, there's a reckoning and you are going to have to shift your base. And they have had to shift their base. This country is going to have to shift its base too. Now, the people who are running around have, being so fearful are not the ones in the driver's seat. They're hoping that the people in the driver's seat are going to take care of them. But let me tell you something. One thing about greedy leadership is that it never gets enough. It's always taking care of itself. And then it's only taking care of those that they consider essential. And if you're not essential, guess what? You go under the bus. And it happens all the time. You've got people in the Senate who are supportive. The senators stand up and sit down, stand up and sit down, like they're some kind of puppets. You're not a puppet, you're a man. And you are also responsible for representing a group of people who are looking to you to act like you're a leader. And so what if you don't get elected again? Let your legacy have one of integrity. And my last question to you is, what are some of the things you would say to the new generation of leaders? And that's probably people in their maybe 20s and 30s. Leadership is a part of being experienced. I think they, these people love social media. I am not on social media. I think they spend a whole lot of time chatting back and forth with each other. The point of the matter is we have a lot of work to do and it has less about talking and more about doing. We need to have structural changes in this country and that takes knowledge of what the structure is to be able to say, this needs to be moved, that needs to be moved, this person needs to go. You need to understand policy. I don't like what is going on in public education. That is the point. I don't like what's going on in my neighborhood, in my neighborhood schools. I mean, we have to begin to pinpoint very specifics about what we're talking about because the whole country is not gonna change overnight. It's not gonna happen. But what can happen is that people can begin to think how am I contributing to this? You know, there is a $23 billion gap between what goes into white public education and what goes into black public education. And that's billion with a B as in Billy. That is humongous. Which is to say, those of us who are black and who are educated, we are what? The talented 100th? <laughs> you know? I mean, but the libraries are free. The libraries are open. Uh, there are community sessions going on all over the country. Everybody who comes to a community session can learn. Um, and I, all I can say is I don't have a blueprint. There's so many things that are wrong. But I think that to begin to make the changes and you have specific recommendations and you have workable recommendations, you know, that's what I would say. That's, that's about the size of it for me. Well, thank you so much for all of your time and all of the things that you have been involved in over the history of a lot of years that you have definitely made a difference. And I am so appreciative of you sharing what you shared with us today. Well, I thank you for the invitation to uh, give, to share with you and in some cases give you a piece of my mind. <laughs> That's okay. And I, and I hope that it is taken uh, with uh, the, the best intentions. It okay. absolutely is. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. If you enjoyed this video, please join Kent and me and please subscribe free to this channel. Share it with your friends and click on the thumbs up icon to like us.